for those of you who only know the title of this book, Nobody Hates Trump More Than Trump, you might think it is an anti-Trump screed. It is in a way, but it is much more than that. There's a whole chapter called Why Trump is Going to Be Reelected," using mostly quotes of Trump critics. So David, first of all, I want to just read what your publicist said about this book and get you to say whether you think your publicist got it right. Okay. It said, once a psychological investigation of Trump, a philosophical meditation on the relationships between language and power, a satirical compilation of the collected wit and wisdom of Donald Trump, and above all, a dagger into the rhetoric of American political discourse. A fair uh, description? Well, Ross, uh, first of all, thanks for doing this. It's really great to chat with you. And I guess I would say in the, you know, truth and advertising realm, as you probably know, most writers write their own flap copy. And I actually wrote that, as you can probably <laughs> get. So I would support that. I mean, great. it's somewhat inflated rhetoric, somewhat self-congratulatory in an appropriately Trumpian vein. But I did write that. And uh, so you're like Grand not Withstanding, I think that's a good, if slightly generous, summary of, of the book. You know, I think I, I read that off of the press release, and it didn't attribute it to you. So in some ways, you're like Trump, and that you, you, you imitate or come across as your own publicist. There you go. I mean, there's that, that famous, you know, the moment where often Trump, in this fascinating way, as you probably know, Trump would... Call, people would call, this was in the 80s and early 90s, people would call asking for information about Trump. And then Trump using the name, what is it, John Bannon? Does anyone recall? John somebody would speak in exactly his own voice saying, I'm Donald Trump's publicist and Donald Trump is wooed by the world's most famous beauties, and he's a billionaire many times over. I'm sorry, Mr. Trump can't speak with you now. And he would be speaking in exactly his own voice in this rather bizarre way. But in any case, there is a funny moment in the book where someone accuses me of being Trumpian in that, that way. And I think part of my rhetorical strategies, part of what I'm interested in, my book is I'm interested in Complicity. I don't know if you know that essay I wrote, Ross, about George Bush several years ago, in which it's called, what was it called? Uh, forgetting the title of it. But, you know, I tried to own. But our complicity. Yeah, our complicity. My complicity slash your compl complicity. That is to say, weird ways in which I'm human and flawed and broken and messed up. I'm not Donald Trump and I don't pretend to be and I definitely don't think that by understanding all that we pardon all, like I'm actively involved in an attempt to stop the thugocracy of, of Donald Trump, but trying to understand him as a human being, I'm trying to find weird points of connection. And in the book there is a funny moment where a friend of mine accuses me of having sort of Donald Trumpian branding gestures where I often take other people's original text and remix them and sort of slap my Shieldsian brand on them. So he accuses me of being sort of a Trumpian brander, which I push back. But Against, But I think the larger point is, I think if all that we do is stand on a very clean moral promontory and wag our fingers at how terrible Donald Trump is, the conversation goes nowhere. The thing I want to try to get to is what weird American bells does Donald Trump chime that he was able to resonate, still resonates with, say, 50 million people. And I want to get to that. That's kind of a core element of the book. But I also just want to get to the title. Uh, the title of it, uh, Nobody Hates Trump More Than Trump. Well, by all outward appearances, Donald Trump doesn't hate himself. He has a very high self-regard. He's smarter than his generals. His gut instinct is better than the data of scientists. And my favorite, he's got the best words. <laughs> so, so why the title, No One Hates Trump More Than Trump? 
Well, it too is meant to be slightly rhetorical, sleight of hand, you know, that we all are competing, especially in Seattle probably, for who hates Trump the most. <laughs> it becomes a kind of parlor game or even dinner dare. You, you know, Trump for 1,000, who has the most moral fury at Donald Trump. And part of me is that I was wearing myself and wearing my friends with my Trumpian outrage. But also, so part of me was trying to say, can we intervene in this conversation? The left, you know, the way that I put it in the book, Ross, is the left is playing badminton and the right is playing ice hockey. And I was sort of, that it's time to start playing ice hockey here. And so <clears throat> there is a secondary meaning, which is pretty important to me, is that for all of Trump's supposed egotism and narcissism and vanity and self-congratulation, that as we know, behind every bully is a, a baby dying to get out. And to me, any insight into Donald Trump begins and ends with understanding what a profoundly dead, wounded, broken, shattered human being Trump is, that he takes what is, is wounded with him. I don't think he's had a real feeling since age, age nine. He is the sort of walking dead. I don't think he's had a, a, a real feeling for a very long time. And that I think the part of the book's argument, part of the, the trajectory of the book is to argue it's precisely Trump's emptiness that resonates with a large population. So I think he is, despite his, as we all say, pathological narcissism, underneath that narcissism is a remarkably self-hating human being. And it's hard to talk about because it's so paradoxical. But you say he uses that self-loathing as a tool. What do you mean by that? It's complicated, isn't it? And you can't prove it. It's not like he's running, he's not like he, he comes out and says, I really don't like myself. And you, you iron welder in, you know, uh, Buchanan, West Virginia, the, you don't like your life either. And so let's, let's bond over our mutual self-loathing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a more subtle shell game than that. For some reason, I think of, of, of this moment of, Maybe two months ago, <clears throat> there was a, a press conference of sorts in the Rose Garden that was televised on, on C-SPAN. And I just watched this stuff nonstop, as you can probably imagine. I challenge anyone to Trump Jeopardy any day of, of the week. <laughs> but um, a young you know, strikingly beautiful network news reporter was called on by Trump to ask a question. And the way the press conference or the sort of pseudo press conference was organized, it wasn't clear that he was about to have people ask questions. So she said, sort of fumbling with her media apparatus and sort of getting herself ready to ask the question said, Oh, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking. So Trump, I don't know if any of, of you saw this, Trump fired back with supposedly rapier-like wit. Of course you weren't thinking. You're never thinking. That's just, in, that's, I mean, of course we can all say, isn't that awful, isn't that misogynistic, isn't that ageist, isn't this, all these things. But that's just so, so, so strange. And then she, all she come, came back with, as most of us would not come back with anything better, it's hard to come up with those perfect lines on the spot. She just came back with, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, like basically saying, did I just hear what you said? You couldn't have just said that, did you? So I'm not sure that's the best example, Ross, but it's the example I think of there is so much self-hatred in projecting your hatred that way toward, you know, a young, beautiful woman in her first job as a network news reporter. It's sort of like, it's understood, that's understood to be anger, but I guess that for me, again, I'm just sort of armchair psychologist here. It just seems to me, 
I think the stuff with the hands is really interesting. He's obsessed with the size of his hands, the, so the way that's become a part of the, the national discussion. Um, also, his response to criticism, which I think you just nail. I, when I got to this point in the book, I went, he's got it. <laughs> to every criticism, basically Trump's response is some variation of this. I am rubber. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. That thing used to say when we were kids. That's exactly what he does to any criticism. Sure. But there's, there's one other example, and, and, and people can jump in if they have. I'm trying to think if there was another recent example of Trump's, and we get to questions, and in 30 minutes we can get to people's own examples. Everyone has their own incredibly vivid examples. But, um, you know, the first chapter of the book is about. You know, I'm very interested in people's childhood. I'm very interested in people's psychology. I'm very interested in how people are raised. And he was he was he was raised by a father who treated him as nothing more or less than a vector on the grid of his own cap capitalist enterprise. Nietzsche was treated by a mother who was um, just remarkably emotionally absent for a variety of reasons, partly to stay out of the way of her rather gruesome husband. And he also had a brother who died of alcoholism. And it's my argument, you know, not, is that he shut his feelings down really, really early on, maybe as early as 14. And he just, you know, I think that Again, I can come up with more specific exam examples momentarily, but I think it is you know the mysterious question that haunts us all: How in the world did this person become the president? You know, albeit with not the electoral, um, uh, with, without a uh, democratic majority, with the in intervention of of Russian bots, et cetera, et cetera. But he still got the support of, of fifty million people. It's it's a bizarre mystery, and I think this. Self-hatred, self-loathing, this deep emptiness projected as violence is not sufficiently discussed. You raised the question in response to um, Trump, like how does one respond to Trump? And uh, you say, is the correct response a howling opposition or a clinical detachment? And you say, that's a good question. So how do you answer that question? Well, I think I bring it up via Rachel Maddow, who I greatly admire and in some ways am frustrated by. I mean, she's a remarkable performer. You know, she's, she's you know, that as you probably know, Roger Ailes greatly admired her. And at one point, you know, the former head of, of Fox News, and at one point he offered her a quite substantial amount of money to go off the air that he would pay her, say, a million dollars to pretend to be a Fox employee, and she has a lot of wide-ranging interests, fr from writing books to fishing. Oh, that's like catch and kill. Exactly. That You know, that he would pay her, again, I haven't been able to find out the exact f figure, but, you know, a substantial amount of money to permanently go off the air. He really understood her, as Marshall McLuhan said 50 years ago, television is a relentlessly cold medium. And Maddow, there was that one interesting moment where Maddow cried, which was completely off brand for her, but she is, she's a remarkable performer who I think, you know, has a huge emotional investment in it, but she always is performing cerebral coldness. And I think it's really an interesting, you know, I don't know if you guys know the wonderful uh, Seattle-based writer Jonathan Rabin, who's obsessed with this stuff as I am, and he's, he, you know, that he and I always talk about sort of what is the best response to this. And I think it's clear in this book, I mean, the way I approach this book, I mean, you would know better than I do, Ross, how it comes across. I think I come off relatively cold and detached and despairing, but somewhat at a remove from it. I don't find that, you know, just endless uh, moral righteous, and like I sort of, I don't know if you, if you read Charles M. M. Blow on the New York Times op-ed page, I think he is good, but there's something about his rhetorical sound which is going exactly nowhere. I mean, the idea of preaching to the choir 
is not a particularly useful thing. So I would say it is a question. Here's Trump with all this. It's just a 24-hour-7, obviously, reality TV show. Like, how do you push back against it? Do you do what, what Adam Schiff does, that kind of cold, cerebral, calm tone? Sometimes that drives me completely crazy. Do you come back with a kind of screechy moral rhetoric? I'm pretty sure that doesn't work, but I'm totally open to being persuaded otherwise. But to me, it's more of a, it's an interesting question in American democracy. How do you fight this? And I would say, I think through cold distance, but I'm not positive. And we'll get your reactions to that uh, in a little bit later. But as, you, as your anecdote about his, what he said to the reporter points out, he's a bully. And a friend writes to you, wishing for a book that ex could explain how to deal with a bully. And your response is, dude, you're reading it. So how does this book respond to the bully? In, I was afraid you were going to ask that, Ross. The, um, <clears throat> you know, I think it's toward the beginning of the book, and it's a bit of an advertisement for myself, where my friend, the wonderful writer and musician, James Nugent, is writing to me. He's, you know, I sort of want a book that takes everything from psychology and philosophy and stand-up and this and that and shows how we defeat a bully, and I just sort of wrote down what I was honestly thinking when James wrote that to me, which is, you know, dude, you're reading it, which is sort of my hope for the book, which is what? How is the book a manual for beating bullies? I think it's knowing, you know, I part of the way the book started for me, to be honest, was that in my professional and academic life, I faced a couple of bullies in my life, and they interested me, and I don't think I handled it particularly well or particularly bravely. And a part of me wanted to really understand what it is. What is, what is it about a bully? Why do they work? Why does Trump work? And the book, in a way, was my attempt to understand the whole relationship between a bully and a bully's victim. And I think if I'm trying to think of how exactly to say that, other than, you know, a bully sort of famously will just continually, it began with the first day of the inauguration of Kellyanne Conway saying, no, there were two million people at the inauguration, not 47 people, you know, that, that, that it just constantly gets raised up. The incremental stakes are raised second by second. So. For one, the obvious thing is you have to be pushing back every single second of every single day to defeat a bully. And you also have to understand, I think, again, to repeat myself slightly, is that a bully's big secret is that there's nothing there. Trump is utterly, completely insecure human being. There's no, there's no there there. And you have to go after his his own brokenness. I don't, I'm not a political strategist, but I do know that, again, it's sort of an easy point now, but you couldn't have imagined a more perfect foil for Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton. I mean, in the book I say, Trump offered, I mean, Obama offered hope, Trump offered rage, Hillary Clinton offered pr precisely nothing. I mean, you can put, can push back against me, as some of my friends have. But her sort of earnest sincerity, her sort of um, foot-stomping Reese Witherspoon-ishness was just like the perfect foil for Donald Trump. You have to be aware that he is broken, that he's incredibly nervous, that he's uh, and I'm not sure how well I'm answering the question, Ross, other than, you know, as they say, fighting fire with fire and not with, you know, turpentine. I want to return to <clears throat> your point about um, our complicity with Trump. One chapter is called 28 Reasons Donald Trump Will Be Reelected," And it includes statements from Nancy Pearl, book reviewer, Brooke Gladstone from NPR's On the Media, white supremacist Richard Spencer, a suggested Washington state legislative policy, and the program of a book festival that you participated in in Washington, D.C. So it appears to me that, that you're saying part of the reason you think Trump will be reelected, if you're serious with that point, is the actions of the people who oppose him. I do. I mean, the book, the, the, 
the chapter title is slightly tongue in cheek, and I think if you had to ask me to bet $1,000 on whether Trump will be re-elected, I would say no, emphatically. So the title is met a little bit um, sardonically. But there is the book has a real trajectory. It, it begins, as I say, with with Trump's childhood, it goes into the way he projects his own emptiness into onto women and onto media culture. And then the fourth part of the book is really an ex exploration of how the politesse of contemporary American academic and literary and media and journalistic culture have, you know, for lack of a, a better word, uh, a kind of moral correctness about it, a kind of uh, refusal to call things by what they really are. There's a whole series of vacuums that Trump fills, from a media vacuum to a, a, a Kardashian simulacrum to a lack of playing ice hockey on the left, but that a big part, I mean, it was something that my wife Lori pointed out very early on, that a lot of people you know, that a lot of where Trump found traction is obviously in lower middle class, blue collar, white resentment. And, you know, the fascinating statistic of five million people who voted for Barack Obama voted for Donald Trump. I mean, that's an astonishing figure. And that um, a lot of it has to do, and I don't have the answer, but there is, a, I'm trying to think of a good example in the book other than the ones Ross mentioned, where I think Trump is expressing for a post, you know, after Barack Obama, I think a lot of disenfranchised and dispossessed lower middle class white people felt that the future wasn't theirs. The future belonged to people of color and to women and to immigrants. And Donald Trump, in many ways, was expressing the last rage, is expressing the last rage of, of what probably many of us hope is a dying animal. And I think that the lack of nuance, the, the, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. I mean, give me the, those examples of once. From that chapter? Once again, Ross, I'm trying to Nancy find. Nancy Pearl, Brooke Gladstone, Richard Spencer, there was a policy, a state legislative policy. Right. Well, you know, the, the, we can argue about every example, but I think Trump is expressing a, you know, a kind of, generalized generalized r rage. I mean, would you push, I mean, well, my I, I, title is meant to be tongue in cheek, yeah. but that the space that Trump filled, and I think it's a real thing. He has real performance chops as a performance artist. He is very good at sort of, it's something that he definitely learned from his lawyer during the 1950s, Roy Cohn, who taught him never answer the question, always be on the attack, always be fighting an imaginary, imaginary enemy. And he also has learned a huge amount from, from his many interviews with Howard Stern, who always taught him what creates media traction is to be saying stuff that you're not supposed to say, whether it's bizarre things about his attraction to his own daughter, whether it's rating um, the beauty of particular women, whether whatever it is, what people are, are galvanized by and drawn to it in a kind of media landscape is saying stuff that you're not supposed to say. And when it's almost like all attention is good attention right. as far as he's concerned. And that basically, I guess the point I'm trying to say is that, that when the left clutches its sort of collective pearls and expresses outrage over certain things, it creates a space in which Trump can be the sort of effective bad boy. There was an 
interesting moment. I was talking to my niece who lives uh, in Brooklyn Heights. She's this really clever seven-year-old kid who was talking about a bully in her class. And she said, you know, he's really awful. He's really, you know, he doesn't allow any of us to learn. He's been really mean to me. And then she had this amazing punchline. She said, but he makes the day interesting. <laughs> and I think that's the Trumpian night, you know, from the mouths of, of babes, as they say. And that um, the point isn't that a lot of the stances on the left are necessarily things I don't agree with, but like what, trying to think of an interesting moment. And I think it was an interesting challenge recently where a newly elected con uh, congresswoman from Michigan said, impeach the, the MF, right? This was just recently. And I think it was an interesting moment where the left had to decide can we use this sort of language, or is this weirdly the province of Trumpian rhetoric? And I must admit I'm somewhat divided because in a way it gave the right and sort of the Fox News echo channel a little bit of chance to pretend to be outraged by such language which they never heard. But in no, a they way- never heard, They never heard shithole countries. Before. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But that somehow, and I felt like in general the left is finally getting it that it's absurd that this language that the, the right and Rush Limbaugh, Fox News, et cetera, et cetera, they all pretend to be outraged by this kind of, of, of language. And I guess in a way that my point is only stop pretending that we're living in some sort of 19th century culture of, you know, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, that we're, that we're living in this unbelievable free-for-all. And, you know, bring, as they say, you know, a gun to the fight. And so I guess that's a that large part. does that make all of us more like him if we sort of adopt that transgressive way of speaking, of dismissing people, of insulting people, both friends and foes? Do we not become Trump when we adopt those things? That's the challenge, isn't it? Somehow the left has become, maybe it's because of, of academic culture and liberal culture and journalistic culture, somehow I, I think that is the gap Trump has, has shot through, that somehow the language of calibrated discourse, a friend of mine who teaches in Sacramento said that all of Trump's whole thing is an assault on discourse itself. That strikes me as a really, useful term, like my whole book is in that very phrase, Trump is an assault on discourse. He's essentially is running a game. I don't know if you guys know the carnival barkers term, kayfabe. Is that a term that you know a carnival barkers use it? It's sort of pig Latin for fabulous, okay, and it's something that the carnies use. And when they're speaking to each other in which they think they have a, a willing victim coming up to, you know, the basketball toss or the pigeon, you know, the concrete pigeon that you're th trying to throw over. Basically, the theory that carnival barkers have is that the carnival barkers know that the carnival's a farce, that you're just not terribly likely to put that particular ring around that particular square because the square has, say, particular rubber on it to make the, the, the you know, the, the, the thing bounce off. But that, strangely, the participant knows it's, it's farcical, too. They sort of know that both participant, both the, the carny and us, the willing victim, know that we're participating in a farce, but it feels oddly fun, or it feels catalyzing, it feels liberating, it feels kind of sexy to be part of this sort of theatrical moment, that at the very least it feels playful, it feels transgressive, it feels antic. And I think like the core of Trump against this really earnest discourse on the left in academic culture, in journalistic culture, in media culture, you know, no offense, on NPR, you know, I, I even do a riff on NPR in which I say, like, I can't listen anymore to its 
its even-handed onesie-twosiness in which, you know, there is an NPR dictum, it seems, in which even the most out, outrageous points get sort of balanced on the other end. And it goes to your point earlier, is the correct attitude to be outrage or to be sort of balanced and detached? And journalism tends to lean toward the detached approach. Right. Although less and less so these days. Exactly. I mean, I think there was a book I wrote a while ago called uh, War is Beautiful, the New York Times pictorial guide to the glamour of armed conflict in which I, I run a, a critique of New York Times front page color war photography in which I argue that the Times pretending to be a sort of neutral arbiter is actually did, I think, do damaging visual protection for the run-up to the Iran and Afghanistan wars precisely by running what felt to me like covertly cheering, that is to say impossibly beautiful photographs of, of combat. And I think that the Times in the Times has been interesting for me in a Trumpian era in which I agree with you just to take them as an example and an important example as running interestingly aggressive journalism against this Trumpian regime. I mean, it's clearly the most important American crisis of democracy since uh, at least World War II. Well, I'll be very interested tomorrow night, as many of you might know, uh, as we're sitting here today on the 7th of January, tomorrow evening the president's going to be addressing the nation for eight minutes. It's going to be on all the networks as well as cable television. And uh, what an interesting thing to see how that will be covered when you've got mainstream newspapers like the New York Times and Washington Post regularly calling out falsehoods, numbers of falsehoods in different categories. Will they run that eight minutes straight through? Will they have a crawl? That will, be, will, will they afterwards be having opposition on? It'll be very interesting to see how that plays out tomorrow evening. And also, you pointed out to me earlier, Ross, that when President Obama asked for apparently a very similar amount yes. of time on, on the, the very issue, Obama was denied. Yes. Which to me goes interestingly to how Trump has learned to, as they say, work the refs. You know, that he's always, always, always working the referees always complaining, regardless, hoping to get the next call. There's a friend of mine, the wonderful literary critic Richard Nash, who says the business of literature is, is to blow stuff up. And that's a kind of radical theory of what literature and art does. I happen to agree with it. But I think it's really a core to Trump's appeal, that I think very few people, I mean, there's people on the Christian right who vote for him for a relatively narrow Roe v. Wade element. There's a, pay, there's a sort of 1% people who are very wealthy and who want tax breaks. But a huge, huge number of people, tens of millions of people, whose lives have, in my view, entered a rather post-belief life, a work, a life, uh, relatively post-religious, post-spiritual, life, you know, like a barely livable American life. And I think Trump just feels like a glorious carnival, kayfabe. Trump will at least blow stuff up. As the apocalypse arrives, let's at least have some nasty fun. I think it's impossible to underestimate how much Trump's value is he's promising nasty fun. It has very little to do with political discourse per se, and an awful lot to do with just just the sheer pleasure of being bad. It's interesting you say that, because another quote that I pulled out from your book is you write, I think we are a failed, doomed species. So is this the final act in our, in our failure and our doom? Well, there's my... I, this is probably bumming a lot of you out, but I, I come here bringing actually surprisingly good news that as destructive and as malevolent as nihilistic as Trump is, as destructive as 
as Trump is, that my book argues in its final uplifting chapter is that as destructive as Donald Trump is, even more profound a, a drive in him is enormous self-destructiveness. I think he's been wired to come undone since he was a very little kid. And I think there's a strange way in my slight fantasy scenario that he's been building for this moment his entire life. He's now 72. And that he, in a strange way, is welcoming th this moment. His whole life has been building toward this worldwide, not destruction, but self-destruction. Let's hope so. Let's hope He's finally a, coming undone. Let's hope it's a self-destruction rather than a destruction of exactly. the Exactly. And I think that we as a culture are always loving to flirt with apocalypse, that it's part of the American character. I would say it's part of human nature, but it's really a part of, of American character. And I think Trump, in my hope or belief, is going to promise apocalypse and ultimately to deliver his self-destruction of himself. I want to get to your questions in just a, a couple moments. Um, but I do have a few more for you, David. Um, first, just a kind of a factual question. You quote what you say are off-air recordings from Fox News provided to you by an anonymous source. Are these quotes real? They are. They are. I mean, I, you know, I play fast and loose in some of my books with, um, you know, I'm very interested in the poetics of nonfiction. In a way, there's something Trumpian in my argument that I do think in a strange way that, in a strange way, I think that Giuliani is sort of semi-right that, you know, that truth is subjective. I think facts are real, but I think truth can be argued over. But I was terribly lucky to have an acquaintance who used to work at Fox News in a technical capacity, and I was always urging him or her to, um, <laughs> he, was, he or she was telling me all these amazing stories about off-air audio at Fox, and I'm like, my God, how could you not r write a book about all this stuff? Basically, they were all, you know, it's, it suggests that this was all total game theory, that you know, they'd be talking relatively normally about, say, someone who admires Jon Stewart or whatever. Then the moment the camera lights go on, they go totally into Fox News overdrive. I mean, it's just, it's very explicit evidence that, you know, big surprise, but it's really dispositive evidence that this is just complete scam. And so that, you know, basically I run maybe 10 short transcripts of a friend who would just write down what people said. So let's say, um, you know, um, uh, Rand Paul is in, in studio and he's about to talk to, you know, Sean Hannity. And they're just talking in a relatively normal voice about stuff. And then, you know, it's just, I mean, what did you make of those as someone who's been on, on radio for 30 years? I, 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 having been in situations where I didn't know the mic was on, uh, all right. You really, you really need to always think that the mic is on. So it's I was a good actually, point. I actually, that's why I thought it might have been a construct been of yours invented, because no. they were so revealing. And we'll just have to have you read the book to find them. There look you go. The, look for the Fox quotes. Um, do you ever just resent the fact that Donald Trump takes up so much of our mind space, that we spend so much time thinking about him or talking about him and writing books about him? Do you ever wish you just didn't have to spend the time with him? I think that is suggest what is damaged about me. No, I, I find I find Trump like I find, I mean again that I feel like if Trump can resonate in me, who's a pretty hard left person, I can find points of echo in in my I I found him among the most amazing subjects of any book I've ever done. I found I find him utterly compelling, scary, frightening. He's one of the great modern. Figures. I mean, tell me a better detective story that's been written ever than this whole unraveling mystery. I mean, tell me a more interesting uh, post postmodern, you know, anti-hero than Donald Trump. He, emb he embodies every single aspect of the American character. In, in the book, I think I argue, you know, he has swallowed America whole. He is America itself. I mean, 
what American con man more perfectly embodies all of our our flaws and our 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 credulousness that that Donald Trump. So it is a sadness in me or a, a pathetic a, a, a pathos in me, but I I don't resent it. I'm you know stupidly and selfishly kind of grateful for him as a subject. I mean that's just the writerly part of me. The the citizen part of me is, you know, is horrified and I work heavily to defeat him. But as a writer, I f cannot turn the stuff off, I must admit. Okay, one final question, then we'll get to your questions. Um, you write, for nearly 30 years now, I've lived in Seattle, which oh, I despise no. you're gonna add, with every you're gonna fiber quote, of my being. <laughs> you're going to quote this, Ross? I you're knew right. you would do that. Um, but anyway, if there's a, a moment I've prepared my response in case there's a, a moment where I, I'm walking down the street and I fall and I badly hurt my shoulder and I grab the, the fence and I, I go down and I'm screaming. And then in that weird Seattle passive aggressive way, everybody just walks past me <laughs> in not a sort of urban way, but, but kind of a way like, gee, I'd hate to interfere with this guy's life. And so in, in the moment, you know, I feel like I, I say something like, I despise Seattle with every fiber of, of my being, which is meant to be the way I feel at that exact moment. But I, I have, you know, like, again, to quote my friend Jonathan Raymond, who says, you're not supposed to love where you live. You're supposed to live in productive disgruntlement with where you live. <laughs> and I definitely live, I find Seattle a productively disgruntlement generating locale. Okay, uh, I'd like to get to your questions. We are recording this, but we don't have an audience microphone, so if you could come up here, we can pick you up on this microphone, so we'll be able to have it in the recording. Who has a question about the book, about Perhaps I know some of you have read some of his previous books. And feel Anything free you'd like to follow up on to push back, to ask, you know, to say I don't agree with you. What do you mean? I find your take problematic. I'm, you know, don't feel again that left politesse. You know, push back hard as need be. So, uh, what's your name? Philip Wallstetter. Thanks, Philip. Uh, it, I haven't read it, but I, I, I like what, where you're going. Thanks, Philip. With it, I, the notion that. Uh, Particularly that the Trump, when he was elected, it was as much of a shock to Republicans as it was to to the uh, to the liberal Democrats who were who were in in office. That that the, they only later discovered it that it was serendipitous that they had got in the office and they could do the things they were going to do anyway. But they sent it a disaster. And there's something uh, that we like about Trump because he's not those insiders that have been in politics and both Democrats and Republicans for so many years. Uh, essentially, uh, the people who've been saying, oh, the job situation is great and so forth, who are close to Wall Street. Nobody likes them, and it's not that Trump is a solution, but he, he, he's like reality television. Everybody laughed at it who were professional uh, TV executives, sure. but suddenly it responded to something. So he's this kind of stream of consciousness of America that's coming out. Now, it, the question is not, do we respond with civility? Civility is the problem, right? Civility is the, civility is the way of keeping out of public discourse everything that is agonizing in the country. You know, and it, it, it belongs to the commentariat. It belongs to the, the uh, centrist Democrats who've, who've uh, dominated for so long. If you want to look at where the voice that is coming that is against Trump is, look at Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or uh, the woman who said mother <laughs> which by the way you didn't say, you just said MF. Just you because know, that we're taping well, it for CBS News back there. <laughs> that's and the point. We, have to, we have to break the sort well, of liberal I'd, commentary. I'd like to get your response to your central well, point let, there. Let, which let is, me finish this one point over here, which is that Ocasio-Cortez, her response to him is to cook in her kitchen and put out videos and sort of talk about, in other words, she's not trying to be one of those Democrats who embodies being the adults in the room, which Obama, she's just being herself, as is the woman who yelled mother and that's the way to get back at Well, Trump. is civility a problem? Is civility a problem here? Well, you know, 
I yield to no one in my capacity to swear in public. So I think I was just, you know, I was maybe I was falling into that that liberal trap of I was Ross begged me not to use a bad word and Ed Ed Mays, who is videotaping it for free speech TV, asked me not to use a bad word. So I did, but um I like what Philip said, you know, that um I don't know if you have I mean I don't have any that is the very dilemma that that we're in. Is Ocasio Cortez is she the answer? Is the Michigan Congresswoman the answer? I mean, maybe. I I'm not sure what my response is, other than to double down on my basic argument, which is, you know, that I think we're in agreement, Philip, that Trump is not a political solution for anyone, right, left, center. He was a stylistic rejoinder to a culture uh, of pablum, that he reads as real. It's not unconnected to a book of mine I wrote in 2010 called Reality Hunger, a manifesto. In my sort of fantasy nightmares, I think of Trump's team as practically reading that book in that the Trump is nothing but the embodiment of reality hunger in the sense that he he reads as real. It's a total performance. It's He's, a, I think, a gifted performance artist. And in his inauthenticity, he reads as, quote, uncompromisingly real. And I think that's his, that's what makes him have traction with a wide swath of people. And I guess part of it is the left doesn't do it as well. Like, it's weird. You know, like the way, you know, comedy is not pretty. That, you know, comedy in a way is old-fashioned. Comedy satire is conservative in a sense because you're making fun of, of, of what's there. So... I don't know. I don't have any. Roz, do you want to jump into Philip's point? I think that we're largely in agreement, other than you. You know, you criticize me for saying I think, MF, but I think he might be stylistically appealing, but substantively, he's virtually wrong on every issue. Sure. I mean, yeah, there are, I, I can name given. on one hand the number of issues where he actually has done something good, and give him credit where credit is due. The whole move to reduce mass incarceration got a, a tiny step forward by the program that he signed off on that he got Mitch McConnell to put before the Senate, a tiny good thing to do. He talks about improving infrastructure in our country, which I think is something that a lot of people could get behind, but he doesn't done anything on that. But everything else, I mean, virtually everything out of his mouth is turns out to be a lie or a, a misconstrued fact or stuff that's flat out wrong. His whole speech tomorrow night on immigration being the massive danger to the country, I think anybody who's read into this sees that that's a fallacy, but he's building a whole, he shut down the entire government over that. Some of the things I have, the publisher thought were sort of the residue of white male privilege, that in a way the very thing is I worry about, like for instance, what's the best response to Trump? Is it, you know, cold, cerebral, Maddo-like wit, or is it Charles M. Blow-like moral? Outrage, you know, and it's a rather privileged thing to worry about. Whereas, say, mothers and children at the border are being, you know, sometimes systematically murdered. And I think your point's a good one. And I don't know if I totally avoid or escape that problem, other than to try to be honest about it, not to hide behind kind of what seemed to me a book that a lot of other people could write, which is a really simple, you know, sort of finger-wagging book that Trump is really bad, which I take as a given, and it's just not the book I, w I would write. You know, I would try to say he's really bad, and here's why he's working as a cultural phenomenon, and here's some scary points of connection between perhaps Trump and me here and there. The book is maybe a little white, a little male, a little middle class. And I think part of what I explore in the book is, in a way, Trump is the world's worst personal essayist, which is what I am. He always runs everything. I hope I'm not the world's worst, but I am a personal essayist. <laughs> Trump runs everything through the self, every single time, like where 
Obama would stand on, you know, immense gravity and ceremony. Everything with Obama was as if it were written in stone and concrete, and he sort of did gravitas, as they say, very well. But it never seemed exactly human. It sort of seemed human, but it seemed very monumental for a variety of reasons, having to do hugely with him being the first black president. So he felt immense pressure in all kinds of ways to be monumental in those particular ways. That Trump wires everything through his own highly personal self. After the shootings in Pittsburgh of, was it nine people at a, a temple? And there was a call for Trump, I'm trying to recall all the events, where there was a call for Trump not to attend a midterm election rally, not in Pittsburgh, but let's say in Cleveland. There was a sense of out of proper duty and gravity and ceremony that it would be improper and morally problematic for him to go on with the... So Trump actually said, and you know, you can, we can all get upset, but we have to understand how it's, it's working. He said that he was thinking of canceling the ceremony and then dot, 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 punchline, because he's having a bad hair day. He actually said that. You know, I don't know if you recall it. But I think our whole challenge, and again, I don't think I've answered it fully. Some of you have, have your answers. You can't be outraged every time. Like, I can't believe he said bad hair day after the killing of, of nine people at a, a Pittsburgh temple. That's very strategic. And it's, I, I think whether he's an idiot savant or he gets great coaching or he has weird instincts for how to be productively nasty, I mean, that is so, that resonates massively with a huge part of the population. I guess the point I'm trying to get to is that I really expose my own vulnerability. I own my own weaknesses. I show how broken I actually am. And I think there's a huge difference between that and Trump hiding his, wound, his woundedness behind this false masquerade of monumentality. So do you renounce reality hunger then, based on what you've said? Well, the that, question is, do you renounce reality hunger, his earlier book? That is a fascinating question. This was a book I wrote in 2010, which uh, the fellow asked me if I, if I now renounce the book. And I think part of this book worries that a bit. There's parts of the book in which I say, you know, I mean, it's be absurd and quite grandiose to pretend that you know, I think that anyone in Trump's immediate orbit is likely to have read the book. I think it's more it's filtered into the water. I'm hardly the first person to make these arguments. Any final concise questions? Yes. Uh, so, how do you explain Trump's cult-like following? How do you explain Trump's cult-like following? Cult-like. Cult -like. Um, I, I mean, I've tried to. Uh, ex I mean, I've tried to surround this a little bit. A friend of mine was telling me over dinner beforehand that you know there's on the Christian right. I don't know if any of you have seen this article. I haven't read it yet, but my friend Jan was telling me about this article in which the Christian right has backformed him as I think it's called a Cyrus figure who, where in the Christian, I don't know the text as well as I should, but that basically that, that we're going to somehow revisit Trump as a bad guy who somehow is a function of, of the Christian mission. And anyway, I mean, I think Ed's question is in a way the question hovering over this entire conversation. And I, I've tried to answer it as well as I possibly can, that he clearly is a cult figure. You know, as you probably know, he studied, you know, it's just simply a matter of fact that for many years, Trump kept, um, Hitler's speeches on his bedside table that's been uh, attested to by two of his ex-wives. I mean, there's... Whose speeches? Hitler's? H Hitler's speeches were kept at Trump's bedside uh, through at least two marriages. I mean, there is method to this madness and that it's really easy to think he's, you know, in many ways he's stupid, in many ways he's obviously incredibly wily, and that, 
you know, that, that famous line that everyone quotes, that, you know, I could shoot some, someone on, on Fifth Avenue and I would still remain um, the leading candidate for president. And that, um, you know, I, I feel like I've tried to answer the question. I, perhaps I haven't. I hope the book attempts to that basically that I think what has happened, you know, to repeat slightly, the say Hillary, for instance, or like Joe Biden now are talking about policy. Trump is not, Trump's appeal is, he, I think he taps into, for certain people, a, a very deep reptilian limbic part of the brain. I think he, he catalyzes unbelievably ancient parts of the human brain that go back, you know, millions of years to ancient animal drives. And that he, he his, his discourse is not deeply political. There's, again, a narrow band of people on the Christian right for whom they want Roe v. Wade overturned. A narrow band of people who are multimillionaires who need tax shelters and tax breaks. But the people that interest me the most, say, those five million people who voted for Obama and who voted for Trump, mainly in the upper Midwest, they, as Philip would say, they f***ing fascinate me. They really interest me. And that I think that what you have to understand is, again, I just go back to he's blowing stuff up, or as Richard Nash says, you know, he's blowing it up. He is making, he, for people who are awash in an America that is a world that is no longer in any way speaking to them, he is expressing incohate, reptilian, primitive rage. And you can't bottle that, I think. Can we give a big hand for David Shields. Thanks, John. That was so fun.